I feel like leaving the house for the airport is so anticlimactic these days. Maybe just because I grew up in such a big family that leaving to do anything was like an event. Nowadays with just me, or even when it's just me and Matt, I'm just kind of like, uh, yeah, I guess I'll go now. And no, this is not alcohol, it's sparkling cider. It was the last thing in the fridge that I needed to get rid of, so here I am getting rid of it. See you in Paris. Bonjour! Welcome to Paris. I realized that this gray couch could literally be anywhere in the world, but I promise you I am in Paris now. <laughs> I'm of course quite tired because, you know, jet lag and I don't sleep well on planes. Although I must say, I think this is the best sleep I've ever gotten on a plane. It's very gray here today, gray and chilly, which is really like the stereotypical Paris weather in my mind. But I must say, Paris may be gray a lot, but it is also very green. Just the ride from the airport to the hotel, I found the greenery so beautiful. I mean, it's also like a lovely time of year to come here. All the trees are in bloom or they have those like bright green new leaves. And there's really clearly an effort in this city to put foliage and landscaping everywhere. There were flowers, daffodils, and tulips, and ugh. It's just, even though it's gray, it's still really pretty. In an effort to be fully honest about my traveling experiences though, and not just pretend like everything is great, I must admit, I'm kind of having a negative moment. You know how Paris is an extremely romanticized city? Like actually Facebook just decided to show me a thing that says that people literally become physically ill sometimes from what they call Paris syndrome, which is literally just disappointment upon arriving here. That's not what's happening here. I try not to romanticize any city because they're cities. People are living and working here. This is just a place. So it's not that I immediately experienced disappointment, but I must say that like, I got hit by a wave of reality. Because the thing is, I have this lovely personality trait. And by lovely, I mean I've been working on it for years because it's not great. Um, I, I literally cannot stand being a bother to anyone at any time. So upon arriving in a country where the uh, language is not English, I kind of get hit by this giant wave of fear because the reality sets in that I do not speak this language and therefore it is almost guaranteed that I am going to be a bother to people. And maybe to you that's not a thing, like maybe to you uh, tourists don't speak the language and that's okay, but I don't have a lot of sympathy for the tourist, unfortunately. I don't have a lot of sympathy for myself in these situations. Having spent quite a bit of time working at places like Disney World, it just kind of sucks for you as an employee when someone walks up to you and immediately starts speaking a different language as though they assume you're going to be able to speak that language to and help them. Because then you feel like you've somehow failed and you're not providing the customer service you're supposed to be providing, you're not doing well at your job, but it's like, I don't, well, <laughs> I don't speak whatever language you're speaking to me. And even when people are nicer about it or more hesitant about it, I just always felt so bad that I couldn't help them. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of sympathy for my side of this. And for me in this situation, I just feel like when I enter any place here, if I start speaking English, then I am being a bother to them by not speaking their own language. And if I try to speak French, I'm gonna be a bother to them for speaking their language so poorly. So Matt and I ran out to get some sandwiches before he had to go to work. And just the experience of trying to communicate that I wanted a sandwich and a cappuccino, just like, whew, it, it flooded onto me this massive fear of like, I am now gonna spend the next several weeks here experiencing the same thing over and over and over again, feeling like I'm a bother. And again, I realized that's not a good 
personality trait for me to have. I accept it as part of myself, but it is something that I'm trying to get over. You have to allow yourself to be a bother, really to just exist in the world. That's just how it works. We are all bothers and that's okay. Um, my brain can say that and then it also like doesn't accept it whatsoever. But anyway, that was all kind of escalated by the fact that I am tired and was feeling gross. So I, uh, I had a bit of a, a lay on the bed and just... <laughs> And then I went and took a very long shower <laughs> and I am feeling refreshed now. So yeah, I thought I would just give a little moment of honesty here of what it can be like to arrive in a country, even when you're so excited to be there. Like I am thrilled to be here right now. I'm so grateful to be here right now. I cannot wait to go see things and do things and eat things here. But I think accepting the reality that like it can be difficult at the same time fun things can also be difficult simultaneously what a conundrum that's good that it, it's good to look at that reality it's good to think about it and talk about it and um be prepared for it i guess but i am on my own for the rest of today i have no plans for today or tomorrow so these are my exploring days I'm just going to walk out the front door of the hotel and keep going, see what I can see. And I'm sure despite the gray chilliness, it will be lovely. Let's go explore and be a bit of a bother. Ooh, y'all. You know what the best thing to do after a very long flight is? Walk eight miles. My feet hurt. Yeah, I, I headed out the door to, you know, wander around and then I looked off in the distance and I was like, ooh, the Arc de Triomphe. How about I just walk there? And it was lovely. I, I meandered my way there. I took a few little side trips here and there to look at the houseboats on the Seine. The Seine? It's the Seine, right? It's one of those words that no matter how many times I hear someone pronounce it correctly and I'm like, that's how to pronounce it. The next time I have to say it, I will completely doubt myself. I feel like it's the same because there's some song where they rhyme it with rain. It's an ABBA song from Mamma Mia. Anyway, took lots of pictures of tulips. The tulips are gorgeous right now. Stared at a bunch of buildings. And it was not until I finally made it to the Arc de Triomphe that I actually looked on maps to see what the mileage was. Four miles, but yeah, I had committed. Something in my brain was like, nope, I'm gonna walk all the way there. I'm gonna look at the scenery on the way. And it was, it was quite delightful. Then for some reason, I committed to walking all the way back. Could have just gotten the Metro. Really could have just done the Metro. It's a lot to go straight up to eight miles of walking in a day when your previous daily average was like, negative two. That's right, I sit so much on a daily basis that it's actually negative walking. But hey, I made it and I feel like I deserve to eat as much pastry as I want for the next several weeks, just based off of this first day. As far as my bout of foreigner fear goes, just getting out there really did help. I don't have to talk to people much because I'm mostly just walking down a street, but I did stop to get some pastries and coffee and I forced myself to be a bother to the lovely lady behind the counter and try to order what I wanted in French. I half succeeded. I got some things that I wanted and then I caved and just said like the easiest and fastest things to say. But I will say if you, like me, fear going to a foreign country and constantly having to bother people with your lack of their native language, it is very helpful to hang around the more touristy areas, especially at the beginning, possibly just the whole time, because it is expected there that you probably don't know the language. So I ended up getting dinner right next to the Arc de Triomphe and both the waiters spoke English or understood English enough. The menu had English subtitles. <laughs> descriptions. So overall it was just, it was an easy interaction. And we're very privileged, us native English speakers, that um, English has kind of been widely accepted as the tourism language. So today was walking, but tomorrow I'm gonna master the metro because that's not happening again. Because the last thing I want to do is start out my trip by destroying my feet. Anyway, I'm not going to continue to film every single day because this video would be 
extremely long if I did. But I will pop back in now and then with some highlights of the trip. So let's transition into whatever it is that's coming next. Hello. It is day six of my time in Paris. It is night, which is why the lighting is terrible, but I'm about to go to bed. I thought I would just check in, give you the highlights of the last six days, what's been going on. So on day two, I very quickly metroed to the same place I had spent hours walking to the day before. I went to the Arc de Triomphe. I got some nice breakfast in a Parisian cafe and I just kind of sat there calmly waiting for my ticket because I did then actually go up the Arc de Triomphe. I always think it's a good idea to find one or two places in a city where you can get a good view. Paris has a lot of them, but where you can see the city from way above and then do at least one in the daytime and one in the nighttime. So this was my daytime one. I found it really interesting comparatively because like New York, when you look down on it from above, is a lot of very tall buildings all packed together. They're all very similar skyscraper kind of styles. London, on the other hand, was my favorite because it's this amazing blend of old and new, and you have a lot of different heights throughout the city. Paris, on the other hand, was actually all pretty flat, not that they're like short buildings, but most of them are around the same height. And then there's sort of an area, like a small little area of skyscrapers. And then you just have like the Eiffel Tower sticking out of the middle. Interesting to note though, there is construction all over the place. Like part of looking out over the city was seeing cranes everywhere. Every city is gonna be under construction in various places but it makes so much sense that Paris would have so much construction because it's so old and it is in constant need of both repairing and improving. So you can't really fault him for that, but be prepared if you're coming to Paris, there is construction all over the place. While you're here, there is going to be at least one, if not several historic touristy places you're gonna go that will be partially under construction. But it reminds me of Disney World. When you go to one of the Disney parks, particularly Disney World, there is always going to be a ride shut down while you're there. But there were several times that guests would express to me like, why is there so much construction? Why is stuff so shut down here? Like, shouldn't it be in pristine condition for me? And I'm like, no, no, it cannot be in pristine condition for you. It has to constantly be under construction in order to continue existing. I don't know, it just, the parallels were interesting to me. Anyway, after going up the Arc de Triomphe, I walked around, I walked to the Eiffel Tower, um, there were massive, massive lines, and I think they were only selling tickets to the second floor at that point. So I was like, Psh, no, I'll come back later to go up the Eiffel Tower. So I just sat in the garden next to it and did some sewing. I walked around all the areas in front of it, and that was all I did on day two. Day three, I had one of the few things that I pre-booked about a week in advance, which was afternoon tea at the Ritz. So I metroed down to like the Palace Royale area and I walked around and um, walked some more. I walked over to the Place Vendôme. I don't know how to say that one. I should look it up, but I'm not gonna right now. Which was particularly interesting to me because my favorite movie, and I have trouble saying that I have a favorite movie, but I really do think that this is my favorite, is How to Steal a Million. It's so good, go watch it. First of all, the character is staying in the Ritz. So I was very interested to see sort of the outside of the Ritz and what it looks like. But also there's some scenes that take place here. So it was really fun to see. It's so classic to me. I've been watching it since I was so young and then it was like, oh, here it is. And then at last I had afternoon tea, which was a delightful experience. Afternoon teas usually are. I will say you kind of forget, or at least I kind of forgot that like afternoon tea is not a French thing. It is a British thing. The French version is very sweet, or at least this one was. It was completely sweet. And um, yeah, I was 
basically in a sugar coma by the end. Delightful experience. I also went to two bookstores this day. Uh, this one looked like it was a small little bookshop and then when you kind of went in and went around a corner there was all this other stuff that wasn't books but it was like paper products, it was writing sets, it was I don't know, it's all those things that you only find in stores like this and all of it was so pretty. The other one is called Galignani? Galignani. Gal Galignani. That seems like an Italian name. The sign next to it said that it was the first English bookstore on the continent. Cool bit of history there. They did have a large section of the store that was books in English, including some of the most stunning Stunning classic literature pieces. Ugh. Day four! Day four I had some pre-book stuff as well. I had already gotten tickets for the Galerie Dior because those apparently do sell out, not hugely in advance, but a few days in advance. And then while I was at it I got some for the Yves Saint Laurent Museum. I will say the Yves Saint Laurent Museum was not huge. It, it took me like less than 45 minutes to walk through the whole thing and that was even going pretty slowly. It was definitely interesting to see but like if you don't have time. The Dior Gallery on the other hand I highly highly recommend. This gallery is huge. I kept expecting it to end and it just kept having another room and the way that they've done it Ooh. It's stunning. Stunning. Every room I walked into I was so blown away by like how immersive and gorgeous it was. And then to get to look at all of this clothing close up and I was just studying all of the seams. And that final room, the final room is an experience. You have to just like sit down for at least a full five minutes because it cycles through this entire projected show and you can't just walk through it. You need to stay and see the whole thing. After that I had some extra time so I walked over to the Petit Palace. The Grand Palace is under construction. Um, but yeah, the Petit Palace, very beautiful on the inside. Um, some great artwork and just significantly calmer. I did not know at the time but I am telling you now with hindsight. Significantly calmer than a place like the Louvre which is what day five was all about. The Louvre. Before I got to the Louvre I, you know, got there pretty early and was walking around the Tuileries. Tuileri <sighs> Y'all, some French I feel like I can pronounce really well and then other words I look at and my brain is just like flatlining. As I was walking around I noticed that Angelina, which is a very sort of a touristy um, cafe that has a long line usually. It did not have a long line. So I went in there for breakfast and quite frankly I understand why they always have a long line. People are not kidding about their hot chocolate. It is... it's the best hot chocolate I think I've ever had. Then I popped into the line, got into the Louvre. Y'all here's the thing about the Louvre. Go all the way up to the top floor. There's a bunch of paintings up there. Not a lot of people. In fact, there were times that I was like, what happened to all those people that were in that massive line? Because there's like five of us here. Then I went back downstairs and remembered that the Mona Lisa is in this museum and everyone just wants to see the Mona Lisa. That's where all the people were. So basically all of the lower floors were just massive crowds of people, most of them trying to figure out how to see the Mona Lisa and walking in that general direction. So I'm really glad that I spent like probably more than an hour on that top floor first and just sort of took my time and sat and stared and wandered and had a nice time because once I came back downstairs I switched into crowd mentality which for me is like squish my body into the pencil skinny line that I can and then like power walk my way through people because I don't want to be in the crowd. Once I ended up in those massive crowds of people it was kind of over for me so I headed my way on out of the Louvre and finally decided that I should get some dinner before going home so I popped into a cafe as one does in France. You just pop into cafes. And by the time I left 
the sun was setting. And I'm not a big night person. I have no interest in the night life of a city, but I did want to see Paris after dark, specifically the Eiffel Tower. So I had decided that one night I would stay out and do so. And as I was exiting this cafe to the most glorious, beautiful sunset over the garden that I cannot pronounce, I was like, you know what? It's happening. The sun is setting. It's already pretty late. I am still out, so now is the time. So I proceeded to walk half an hour to the Eiffel Tower, watch it sparkle, cause yes, it's beautiful. And then I was like, you know what? I'm here. I haven't been up the Eiffel Tower yet and I haven't seen the city at night from above yet. Let's just kill all the birds with this one stone. And the joy of going into the Eiffel Tower at like 10 o'clock at night is that the crowds are pretty much all gone. You can walk right up and buy a ticket to go all the way to the top, which is what I did. And yeah, I saw some absolutely beautiful views of Paris at night. As much as I am not a night person, I do love the sight of a city at night. And now I've had my one night where I was still awake and not in my hotel room while it was dark, so check that off the list. And that brings us to today, day six, in which I had planned to go to the Paris flea markets. And then I was like, oh crap, it's raining. But then I also looked it up and apparently they're a great place to go while it's raining because they're mostly indoors and or covered. I'm saying this like I don't know for sure. I've been there now, yes, I agree. If it's raining or drizzly outside, go to the Paris flea market, great place to be. There's two, maybe three kind of different areas to the flea market. The first one was definitely my favorite. First of all, you have to walk through like the, huh how to describe them. The stands that you're kind of like, oh, I'm just in a mall right now. You're just selling like shoes and clothing and purses, but it also kind of feels like all of this stuff fell off the back of a truck. Yeah, you have to walk through all of that first, tell several people that no, you don't want to buy an iPhone out of their hand. And once you get through all of that, you enter the sort of actual flea market section and like immediately it's this sort of enclosed little world and it's like all of that melts away and you're in this little fantasy glen. <laughs> People had so much stuff in their shops and they arranged it in like this very like cluttered but aesthetically pleasing way that just, ugh, it was just inspiring to look at. And then of course that makes you wanna buy everything. I'm kind of grateful that like I can't buy anything without having to get another suitcase and I really don't wanna do that because it kept me from buying anything. Although it was really hard to resist this mushroom tea set because oh my God, that might be the cutest thing I've ever seen. So yeah, that one is definitely my favorite area. The other one was like a two story, more indoor place. It was definitely also cool. There were a lot more like booksellers or I guess like everyone here kind of had a category. You'd be selling your books or music or clothing or whatever and you could kind of go through. There was an incredible shop there that I don't think I got any footage of because it was a little intimidating and there were lots of signs. A lot of places say no photos and like respect that. But yeah, there was this one store shop stand. It was quite large that had tons and tons of vintage clothing, like very well preserved. Gloves, hats, shoes, dresses, uniforms, like you name it, they had it. I still had quite a bit of day after finishing there, so I decided to go ahead and take the metro down to the, this one has a really long name, to the big white church. It was kind of funny because I got off the metro coming from above rather than probably coming from below where most tourists would be coming from. So I was just like walking through these quiet, sort of normal, I wouldn't say quiet actually, normal, very normal neighborhoods. And I came up on the back of it and I was like, okay, there's the church. Like this must be like a very down day on tourism. Maybe not like a lot of tourists come out here because it all just seems very quiet. And then I circled around to the front and it was like, oh God, there they are. Yeah. Very touristy place. Montmartre? 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 I keep wanting to pronounce French words 
like their Portuguese words. Yeah, that area is very popular for tourists. You have the church itself, which is absolutely beautiful, and then sort of this whole like fountain and garden in front of it, and then you have this very touristy street in front of that that mostly has like tourist shops. So yeah, all of that area was really fun to walk around, but what I mainly discovered is that that is where the fabric district is. I mean, I kind of already knew that, but I didn't realize it would be as incredible as it was, cause y'all, it's incredible. I would take this Paris fashion district, fabric district, whatever you want to call it, over the LA one any day of the year, any day of the week. The LA one is really cool, but very intimidating to me. It's a lot of small and very deep stores that have been completely packed with material. And so you have to like enter the store to see anything and like cram through and then you're sort of immediately like accosted is a strong word, but accosted by whoever owns it being like, what can I help you with? What can I get you? Blah, blah, blah. And I don't like to be talked to while I'm shopping. Love France for that. No one will talk to you while you're shopping. So this was so much better to me because every store had like these massive bins on the outside of the stores that were all like their sales stuff. And then when you go in, they're all very big and open and long and they have lots of twists and turns and stuff everywhere. And as I said, no one will talk to you unless you ask for help. And I love it. I love it so much. Please don't talk to me while I'm shopping. I'll ask you if I need help. I did find it interesting that apparently like pre-cut pieces of fabric, which I believe they call coupons, very confusing. I looked up what is coupon in French and it was like coupon. A coupon is a coupon. But I was like, why are they calling fabric? Coupons. Someone who's French explain it to me, but I'm assuming that a coupon is a pre-cut piece of fabric and it seems to be really popular. Some places pretty much only had that or mainly had that. But yeah, these fabric stores, man, one of them was six stories tall. They have absolutely stunning ways of displaying the fabric. Like most of them had mannequins everywhere where they had draped fabric so that you could kind of see what a dress would look like out of it. They had fabric draping from the ceilings, fabric and valences. Like I have never been in stores that were so focused on being like, hey, here's what the fabric can be like, instead of just being like, hey, here's the fabric. It was amazing. It was so inspiring to see it like this, to see it so beautifully arranged and like chaotic and crowded, but also very clearly organized by fabric type. And y'all, the variety. I saw, I did not get a picture of it because there was a no photo sign, but I saw some of the most beautiful fabric I think I have ever seen. Ugh. And I bought absolutely nothing. I am somewhat benefited by the fact that I become overwhelmed by choice because once again, I really don't want to have to buy another suitcase. But yes, I shall wrap up this little bit here by saying you 100% should go to the fabric district if you are at all interested in fiber arts, sewing arts, textile arts, any form of arts, the way that they display buttons. Like this is just the way, everyone does it this way. And it's so cool. Until next time, which will probably be in another week and then I'll talk for another hour. Bye.